welcome to this week's digital discussion. I'm John Harry, the Programs and Marketing Fellow for the Milwaukee County Historical Society. And uh, glad to have you with us tonight uh, for this talk, uh, Sea Lamprey, the Vampires of the Great Lakes. And if you think that photo is terrifying, just wait for what's coming uh, from our friend Ross from the uh, Great Lakes Fishery Commission. We'll get to him in just a, a few seconds here. Um, I did just want to fill in uh, everybody on uh, kind of some of the goings on of what's happening with the Historical Society. Of course, we have our collaboration beer out right now with Indeed Brewing Company in Walker's Point. Uh, we had our uh, fundraising night with them, Indeed We Can night, um, last night. So thank you to everybody who came out and purchased products. All the proceeds went to Milwaukee County Historical Society, and uh, we appreciate your support there. Uh, if you're interested still in the Lady Elgin beer, the foreign extra stout that you see pictured there, that is still on tap uh, until it's gone um, at Indeed Brewing, and a dollar from every pint, crowler, or growler sold of that will be going to MCHS as well. So just another way you can support uh, the, the work we do at the Milwaukee County Historical Society, uh, going there and checking out that beer. It's just delicious. Um, another thing to uh, mention is we have a podcast series uh, that the second episode of it came out on Monday. So every Monday, the episodes come out. It's called The Healthiest City, Milwaukee and Its Pandemics. And it is about basically the last uh, pandemics we've had here. So uh, everything leading up to what is known now as the Spanish influenza of 1918 um, in a podcast form done in conjunction with the UWM history department and one of the graduate classes there. You can find that at milwaukeehistory.net slash podcast if you're interested in checking that out. It's excellent. Uh, coming up on the horizon next Thursday at six, so a little different time than we usually do. Uh, we have our student art exhibition called My Milwaukee with the Arts Eco Program at UWM. Um, so that is student art projects from the last year. They were asked to reflect on the last year. So if you're thinking about it as an adult, how you reflect on the last year, uh, imagine how students have been going through this and uh, and putting that into artistic form. So that will be uh, next week's project. And then uh, coming up uh, to mark the calendar is April 1st. Anna Lardenoy of Gothic Milwaukee will be doing Tales of Great Lakes Shipwrecks right here too. All right, enough out of me. Let's bring in uh, our guest of the hour, Ross. Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I'm terrified to be here just based on some <laughs> of the photos you've shown me. And, uh, uh, but I, I, I know that uh, this is really important to talk about. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I, I guess I might get it out, uh, out of the way because I realized I didn't include it here, but you don't have to worry. You can swim in the Great Lakes in peace. The, the sea lampreys are not attacking humans. Thank God. Well, uh, so uh, th some, of the, you know, some of the stuff will be kind of shocking, but um, the uh, the – the environmental history of the lakes is super important. And, um, and so uh, it also really, it does affect our lives in some ways. So uh, there's my brief introduction for you. Uh, we'll have a question and answer at the end. Pop those in the comments if you have any questions um, and we'll, uh, we'll throw those at Ross at the end. But uh, Ross, take it away. All right, cool, sounds great. Um, and uh, as John mentioned, my name is Ross Shaw. Uh, I am with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. I'm a communications and policy associate uh, primarily doing our outreach and education program with folks like you. So let's get into it. So um, the sea lamprey invasion. So where, where did sea lampreys come from? Um, so sea lampreys are, are native to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, where ironically, uh, they are endangered. So we're trying to get rid of them here in the Great Lakes, but they're actually endangered in their native range in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so in this picture over here, what you'll see is a uh, chef over in Spain preparing some lamprey to eat as they are uh, quite the delicacy over there. It's um, what you might get if you go to a restaurant and uh, you're getting something market price, you know, uh, fresh, from, um, fresh from a fisherman. Um, so quite the delicacy over there. In fact, uh, we've even shipped um, lampreys over uh, to the Queen of England as uh, she bakes a, uh, a lamprey pie. And so we sent some over, I believe in uh, 2015 or 2010. So um, yeah, so quite, quite the irony there that you know they are endangered in, in their native range, but yet yeah, we're trying to get rid of them over here. So sea lampreys invaded uh, through the uh, man-made shipping canals, uh, namely the St. Lawrence Seaway um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so up until about 1919, um, sea lampreys were only in Lake Ontario. And this is primarily because of uh, Niagara Falls. So obviously the sea lampreys uh, cannot get up the falls and couldn't get into the rest of the Great Lakes. 
However, once the Welland Canal was built in 1919, it was actually widened and deepened. Uh, that actually allowed the sea lampreys to bypass the falls and pro proliferate throughout the rest of the Great Lakes Basin. And then by 1938, they had invaded all the Great Lakes and destroyed many of the commercial, recreational, and tribal fisheries uh, that many of the folks around the Great Lakes depended on. Uh, many of the coastal communities really needed these for their livelihoods, and so um, they were absolutely devastated. And so one particularly hard hit species uh, was the lake trout. Um, so this was a, um, a, a commercially important species uh, to many folks around the Great Lakes. Um, and at their uh, peak, sea lampreys had actually wiped out lake trout from four out of the five Great Lakes. And the only Great Lake it actually remained in uh, was Lake Superior. And this was because uh, that was the, the last Great Lake that the um, sea lampreys had invaded, but also the first Great Lake that uh, sea lamprey control had started on. And so, you know, we, we know sea lampreys are destructive, but how do they take out their destruction? What do they do? Well, they use their mouth, of course. And so when they uh, are attacking a fish, what they do is they use their suction cup mouth to attach to the side of a fish. They use their over 150 razor sharp teeth to dig into the side to make sure they have a sufficient grip. And then they use what we call the rasping tongue, which is a sharp file like tongue to bore a hole into the side of the fish. And so what it will do is it bores the hole into the side of the fish, gets the blood and uh, any nutrients and bodily fluids flowing, and then it begins feeding. So the sea lamprey, uh, will, uh, and once it starts feeding, it actually excretes an anticoagulant to make sure that that blood flows as long as it wants. So uh, it is estimated that out of uh, every six fish, or six out of every seven fish that is attacked by sea lamprey uh, will die. So if that fish doesn't die while the sea lamprey is on there, that wound that you guys can see will oftentimes either become uh, infected and cause that fish to die or make that fish more susceptible to predation. And so during the sea lamprey invasion, um, the uh, folks around the Great Lakes Basin, the US and Canada realized that, um, you know, sea lampreys didn't really pay attention to the uh, many boundaries that, that were throughout the Great Lakes. And so, um, you know, the Great Lakes are highly interjurisdictional. So we have um, two nations, the US and Canada. Uh, we have uh, eight Great Lakes states around the basin. We have two tribal entities and then two provinces in Canada. So out of the recognition that one, no one state, uh, provincial or uh, federal entity was going to be able to handle the sea lamprey invasion and that cooperation was going to be necessary, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission was formed. Uh, and it was formed by the Binational Convention on Great Lakes Fisheries, uh, which was signed by the US and Canada in 1954. And so in the convention, uh, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission was charged with three primary duties. Uh, so we were charged with um, conducting science on the Great Lakes, uh, coordinating fishery management, and controlling sea lamprey. And uh, as you can see from our graphic here, uh, not only do we do all that, but we also uh, have input from a number of different stakeholders. So we have advisors uh, from the US and Canada, as well as uh, specific boards um, that focus on various topics that uh, provide input uh, to our decisions. So now I'll briefly touch on some of those, uh, those three main duties that we are um, assigned in the convention. So the first one uh, is maintain working arrangements, or as I called it, coordinating fishery management. So as we discussed, uh, there's a, a number of different jurisdictions uh, throughout the Great Lakes. So you have uh, provincial, you have state, you have tribal, federal, um, and the Great Lakes faces a number of complex issues that, uh, again, they, they're not obeying boundaries. Um, so you have ecosystem uh, or science issues, um, you're balancing competing interests. And out of this recognition, uh, agencies realized, you know, they need to work together. And so uh, to help facilitate all of these uh, different jurisdictions working together, um, all these agencies came together to sign what's called the jo a Joint Strategic Plan for the Management of Great Lakes Fisheries, which was signed in 1981. Um, so the Great Lakes Fishery Commission actually facilitates this. And you can see in this graphic, what, what this does is it creates what's called the lake committee system. So we have each of the different lakes has a different has a committee. And so on each committee, 
there is an entity that uh, represents one of the jurisdictions. Uh, so you have uh, like the State Department of Natural Resources, you have um, tribal entities, um, a number of different stakeholders. And so what the lake committee system does, it allows these stakeholders uh, to come to each lake uh, come together uh, to uh, avoid duplication of effort, uh, leverage resources, um, and develop shared objectives. And so one of these big shared objectives is what we call the um, each lake's fish community objectives. So for each of the different lakes, all of these, um, all these different jurisdictions come together uh, to decide, you know, this is where we see, we, we want the lake to be going as far as um, uh, ecologically fish stocks or uh, otherwise. So, um, these lake committees come together to decide, you know, where, where do we want things to go and, and make sure that, um, you know, they're working together with all these different jurisdictions. Um, one important and rather interesting note with uh, the joint strategic plan and the, and the lake committee system uh, is that this is actually all um, non-binding. So the, these folks are all volunteering and, and doing this because uh, they realize that uh, this cooperation and this partnership is necessary for the health uh, the health of the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes fishery. So uh, uh, one of the, the second primary duty that the uh, Fishery Commission conducts is coordinating fishery research. Um, and so the basis of this is that, you know, sound science is needed uh, to inform successful management. So the three types of fisheries research that we inform uh, are the three types of research that we, that we uh, fund rather is uh, fisheries research, um, sea level research, which we do through a couple of partnerships with the University of Guelph, uh, Michigan State University, as well as the US Geological Survey, uh, primarily at uh, Hammond Bay Biological Station up in Millersburg, Michigan, which is in the Northern Lower Peninsula. And then we also have uh, what's called science transfer. And so uh, this is a, a pretty neat thing, thing that we like to call, um, you know, we summarize it as getting the science to those who will put it to use. And, and so what I think is really cool about this is um, instead of the traditional uh, paradigm of research uh, where a, a scientist may publish some research and then it's up to the managers to interpret this research, interpret the paper, um, which can be very challenging. You know, science is really hard to understand, especially in something like a research paper. Well, what Science Transfer does is they go directly to the managers first and ask them, you know, what, what are things that, um, that you need more information on? What is something you'd like to know about? And then based on what the managers say, they will actually fund research based on that. And then that research that they're funding, they ensure that um, the products that come out of that are um, communicated in such a way that, that they're very easy uh, to understand um, in, in layman's terms to um, you know, someone like a manager who isn't nearly as technically proficient as uh, someone like, say, a researcher. So one good example of this uh, is right on screen here. So we funded this project uh, that looked at uh, a um, sampling technique called environmental DNA. And so this is a neat little graphic uh, that the the project team produced as part of that. So it get, it's showing that okay, so here's here's how eDNA e works. You connect the you collect the DNA from um, the water, and then it gives a number of different uh, uh, characteristics that can affect the the quality of the eDNA that you're collecting. So you have temperature, you have time, uh, microbes and enzymes, and pH. Um, so the science transfer, uh, in my opinion, is is some really cool stuff that we're funding, and um, it, it really is ensuring that you know we're uh, the the research that is um, being developed for managers is actually being communicated in a way that that managers will understand. So I think that's super cool. And then our final and perhaps most well known duty is um, obviously controlling sea lamprey. So the sea lamprey invasion uh, was one of the big impetuses for. Um, the development uh, of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and the signing of the 1954 Convention on Great Lakes Fisheries. So before we go into writing out how bad sea lampreys are and, and what a pain they are to have in the Great Lakes, I wanna make an important distinction. So not all lampreys are actually bad. So there are five lamprey species in the Great Lakes of which four are actually native. So you can see here, um, the easy way to distinguish them is the sea lamprey, because it's invasive, it's much large, larger than the four native species. So as you can see from this diagram, so we have the, the invasive sea lamprey, which is significantly larger than uh, the four native lampreys, the chestnut lamprey, the silver lamprey, the northern brook, brook lamprey, and the American brook. Um, and so one of the reasons that the 
uh, sea lamprey is so destructive compared to our native lamprey species is because it co-evolved with fish that are out in the Atlantic Ocean. So in their native range, they're gonna be parasitizing uh, things like, um, like whales or sharks or other large fish, think like, um, like a tuna or something like that. So you think about you know, a, uh, a relatively small wound that we would leave on, on something like a tuna, you know, that, that's not really going to uh, affect that, that fish and cause it to die. Well, if you think about the, the sea lamprey comes into the Great Lakes ecosystem where you, all, you have things like, like lake trouts, the biggest, one of the biggest fish, you know, like a sturgeon or something. Um, you know, these fish are uh, much smaller in comparison to what the sea lamprey is normally parasitizing. And thus, they're, they're, uh, that wound that the sea lamprey leaves is going to be uh, much more fatal. So if you look at this diagram, we actually do have two native species, so the chestnut and the silver lampreys. But because they have co-evolved with the Great Lakes species, they're leaving significantly smaller wounds that don't result in mortality nearly as, uh, nearly as often, or at, if at all, uh, as the sea lamprey does. So it is important to realize that, you know, that not all lampreys are bad. You know, the sea lamprey is terrible, but just keep in mind that there are good lampreys out there. And another interesting point that I want to point out about the sea lamprey is that uh, it's likely what it's what we like to affectionately call um, a living fossil. So the sea lamprey lineage dates back to over 359 million years old. So you can see a um, a photo of the uh, earliest sea lamprey fossil that has been found over in uh, South Africa. I believe this is in back in 2006. Um, so sea lampreys exhibit actually many primordial fish characteristics. So um, when you think of a fish, uh, you know, the sea lampreys are missing a lot of those characteristics that, that you think of when you think of a fish. You know, there's no, there's no paired fins uh, up near the front of, of the fish. You know, there's, there's no bony jaw. Um, sea lampreys are actually all cartilaginous. Um, and sea lamp, because, the, because of this, because they're so uh, early on in terms of evolution, um, they're actually model organisms for research in a variety of different fields, uh, including vertebrate evolution, uh, ecology, developmental biology, uh, and chemistry, uh, among others. And in addition to being, you know, er early, uh, early evolutionarily speaking, um, they all, you know, because they are invasive, we do have a lot of, uh, a lot of organisms uh, available for research, so that certainly helps as well. So before we get into uh, talking about the control of the sea lamprey, uh, I, I think it's important for us to understand um, what is the life history, you know, what, what does a sea lamprey's life cycle look like? Um, so I'm going to start here with the, the spawning adult uh, phase of the sea lamprey's life cycle. So um, sea lampreys, when they're ready to spawn, they uh, go, come from the lakes and they find uh, tributaries and streams and swim upstream and then they'll spawn. So you can see from our little diagram here is what they'll do is they'll actually interconnect and then they'll release their uh, eggs and sperm externally to this uh, horseshoe shaped rocky nest where the, uh, the eggs are actually sticky. So the, uh, the sperm will stick to the eggs and the eggs will stick to the uh, horseshoe shaped nest. So when a female goes to spawn, uh, they'll actually lay up to 100,000 eggs of which around 40 to 70 percent are viable. And, and this is primarily because sea lampreys die after spawning. So it, this is their one goal in life. And so, you know, when, when they're going to go and do this, you know, they want to make sure they, they produce some successful offspring. And so if you take a look over here at this photo, you can see, you know, this, uh, this dissected sea lamprey is just jam-packed with eggs. And you'll notice this actually string right here. This is uh, the digestive tract, which at this point in its life, uh, it is no longer feeding. So it, it, it is only focused on spawning. So you can see the digestive tract is so small because it's not interested in feeding. It doesn't need to feed uh, because it's only worried about uh, producing these eggs and producing offspring. So then after uh, it, it spawns, the eggs will hatch out, uh, hatch out and then they're in their what they, what they call the larval stage or uh, the technical term for these guys is amacetes. And so what they do is they'll swim downstream and then they'll burrow into the, uh, the stream bed and, and they'll filter feed uh, from anywhere from three to 10 years. Um, at this point in their life, they're, they're relatively harmless. You know, they're, they're just filter feeding, feeding on uh, phytoplankton, algae. Um, they have no eyes. And so they're just kind of hanging out there uh, relatively harmless until it's time for the next stage of their life, uh, the metamorphosis. 
So at this point, um, C lamprey, when, when the conditions are correct and um, the actually uh, a, a subject of ongoing research is finding out, you know, what, what is it that uh, allows C lampreys to metamorphose? What, what are they looking for? Um, you know, is it environmental conditions? Do, what, um, what nutrients are, are, do they need? So we don't entirely know what, what makes them um, metamorphose specifically at that time. But when they do, um, so they'll metamorphose, they'll grow eyes, uh, their parasitic mouth, and then they'll drift into the lake to feed. So as you can see, you know, at this stage, they're still relatively small, you know, uh, but they do have that parasitic mouth that, that we all um, know, and I hate to say love, but um, rather recognize. So at this phase, they're, they're gonna drift into the lake and feed and grow a little bit, and then comes the most destructive phase of their life cycle, the parasitic juvenile. So this is when sea lampreys go out in the Great Lakes, and they really have, uh, you know, just uh, open season on all the Great Lakes fish. So they'll feed from anywhere from 12 to 18 months uh, after they enter the lake, and each sea lamprey, just one sea lamprey, will kill up to 40 pounds of fish in that 12 to 18 months. And you'll notice our little diagram here. The sea lampreys uh, are on a variety of different fish. And this is because the sea lamprey really doesn't uh, have, it, it isn't picky when it's looking for a meal. You know, they have preferred uh, hosts like lake trout, um, but they'll, they'll really attach to anything. They'll do lake trout, salmon, um, sturgeon, um, bourbon. They'll, they'll even, you know, smaller things like um, bass, walleye, yellow perch. Uh, so sea lampreys are not picky eaters, you know, they're just looking for some, some blood to suck. Um, and then one, once they get their fill in their 12 to 18 months of uh, feeding on fish, they'll swim back upstream to spawn uh, and die and start the cycle over again. Okay, and so now uh, that we've gone over the life cycle a little bit, uh, let's get into the major sea lamprey control methods. Um, so the Sea Lamprey Control Program is a, a binational program um, facilitated by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and a number of our different partners, including the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, so we do have, so we have lamprecides and barriers are two major sea lamprey control methods. Uh, traps are kind of sort of a, a control method. I'll, I'll get into the specifics of that here in a second. So I'll first start off with lampricides, which is our, um, our most uh, common and our most effective control method. Um, so lampricide control is, uh, we, we contract out agents at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, the, and Fisheries and Oceans in Canada um, to con conduct lampricide treatments. And so um, what lampricide is, is um, we're, we're looking for and targeting uh, larval sea lampreys. So you can see these guys right here. And if you'll recall from uh, the life cycle, at this stage, they, they haven't developed that parasitic mouth. They haven't gone out and killed fish. So by getting them at this stage, you know, we're, we're preventing a lot of Great Lakes fish from dying. And so what we do uh, to determine where, where we want to apply this lampricide um, is we have our agents go and uh, do what's called electrofishing. So they'll go into streams and tributaries and they'll um, shock, they actually have what's called a backpack shocker, and what they do is they actually tickle the sea lamprey, the larval sea lampreys out of the stream bed, and then they'll collect them and um, record some data, and then you put that into a model to determine, you know, where where do we have the highest concentrations of larval sea lampreys, um, and then determine where where are we, where do we need to um, apply lampricide to. So once they've determined a good place to apply lampricide, um, they uh, find a, a <clears throat> They, they determine where, where they want to uh, um, apply it at. You know, a lot of the times, and this is, I'll, I'll get into this when I talk to barrier, talk about barriers, but um, and they want to go as far upstream as they know that uh, sea lampreys are or, or can get. So oftentimes this is uh, like just above a, a dam or a barrier or just below it if, if they haven't seen any lampreys uh, above that dam. So um, streams and tributaries, they'll apply this lampricide at a very small concentration, um, and that selectively targets and kills the lampreys with about a 90 to 95% effectiveness with little to no um, non-target mortality. And if there is, uh, so we, there, there are instances where uh, like lentic areas, uh, which are slow moving, um, slow moving areas that are uh, larger and deeper or uh, connecting channels, thinking like uh, the St. Mary's River, which is a, a large connecting channel between uh, the Lake Superior and uh, Lake Huron that runs in between the, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Canada. 
what we do is we apply this Bela side, which uh, we apply by these special uh, special sprayer bones. But uh, again, selectively targets kills on the lampreys uh, very effectively, very efficiently. Um, however, it, it is a rather expensive um, process to take up. And so as you can see from this diagram here, um, these are the, the tributaries where uh, sea lampreys have been found to spawn. So um, this lampricide is really expensive to produce and apply. Uh, so we have to be uh, very strategic with where we apply this lampricide. So uh, we do a, um, a number of uh, different data, uh, data collections uh, to determine where are we going to get the highest uh, cost per kill uh, with these lamprey treatments. And then we also factor in uh, some of these streams and other areas we need to treat on a cyclical basis. Uh, so every three to four years, just based on um, how they've produced lampreys in the past. All right, and so our next major control, uh, our actually only other major control method is barriers. And so uh, the barrier program is facilitated by the Fishery Commission, again, through the Fish and Wildlife Service, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, as well as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, here in the States. And so there's two main types of barriers. So there, there's purpose-built barriers, and these are barriers that, that are built explicitly for blocking sea lamprey, as well as dams uh, such as hydroelectric dams, uh, mill dams, excuse me, um, and, and other structures. So even though they weren't built to block sea lampreys, uh, these guys do a, a fantastic job. And so um, barriers, what, their role in the sea lamprey control program is essentially to prevent sea lampreys um, from reaching new spawning habitat. So in addition to preventing them from um, getting into uh, stream miles, that more additional stream miles that we would have to treat with expensive lampricide, it limits the amount that we have to treat. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, barriers act as a nice cutoff. So we know that, um, you know, we only are keeping lampreys to, uh, from here to here within a stream, um, a stream system. So but barriers um, ensure that, you know, we, we don't, uh, we are unnecessarily applying lampricide and um, that we have, uh, keeping our areas where we're applying lampricide rather small. And then so barriers, um, especially for sea lamprey, they really only need to be rather small. So about a, a foot, foot and a half, and then with a, a lip on the very top, which you can kind of see in uh, this barrier photo. Um, and so because that's so short, the sea lampreys aren't able to get up over it, but then uh, many jam jumping fish are able to pass, as you can see in, in this photo. Um, in other instances, we also have a uh, fishway or a trap of some sort where uh, we know that the native fish are able either to get through the fishway and the sea lampreys aren't, or we have a trap where we have uh, someone come and manually sort uh, the native fish uh, from the invasive fish. And so we did have traps on there. And so uh, traps is a little, uh, gets in this, this funky area where, you know, we traps, what, what we do is we often put them at the, uh, the base of dams because we know that based on uh, the sea lampreys exhibit this uh, characteristic called positive rheotaxis, where they uh, are just inherently um, need to swim upstream. So we often will position dams right at the base uh, or rather position traps at the base of dams where we can take advantage of that positive rheotaxis and cause the sea lampreys to swim in these traps. And so uh, it is sea lamprey control in the sense that when we, we remove the sea lampreys from these traps, however, the trapping efficiency isn't as high, isn't high enough to where we consider it a viable control method. Um, so what we do is when we find a trap, when, when it's time to uh, pull a trap, we remove it from the system and we have uh, all of these animals um, what we'll do is we'll actually um, count them. So we use, we use the traps primarily for assessment purposes. So, um, you know, we'll, uh, these traps catch um, adults that are running upstream to spawn. And so we'll see in these, in these traps from year to year based on the size of uh, the, the number of animals that were uh, catching these traps that can help us determine you know, what, what is the size of the spawning run, uh, what's the size of the sea lamprey populations. Uh, and you can see um, some of our folks from USGS and US Fish and Wildlife Service here. What they'll do is they'll um, remove the sea lampreys. They actually sex them uh, to help them, again, uh, determine population dynamics. And then they uh, take them up to our research station up in uh, Millersburg, Michigan, the, the Hammond Bay Biological Station. And there, uh, the sea lampreys will be used either for, uh, for research 
or we actually use them for our, our outreach program. Um, normally in non-COVID times, uh, we, we're going all across the Great Lakes Basin with live sea lamp rays, uh, letting, letting folks like you guys um, be able to touch them and get hands-on with the sea lamp rays. So, um, so yeah, although, although it is not a, um, you know, a major control method, we still, it still is very important uh, to the sea lamp ray control program in the sense that uh, it, it helps us uh, determine population sizes of the sea lamp ray uh, population. All right. And then for a second, um, because I first started the Fishery Commission doing history, and I'm kind of a history nerd, um, I wanted to take a little bit of time to um, take a look back at, at control. Um, so when, when the Sea Libraries first invaded, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, so many of the Great Lakes communities were dependent on um, the, the commercial fisheries, the recreational fisheries, the tribal fisheries that the Sea Libraries were destroying. So uh, people were extremely desperate uh, to do anything they could uh, to uh, control the sea library population. So some of the more interesting uh, early control methods was uh, cooking sea libraries. Um, I have not had the, the pleasure of having them, but um, from what I have heard, their meat is really gray uh, and they do not taste good. And um, in the Great Lakes specifically right now, you do not want to eat them because they do contain heavy metals uh, from many of the fish that they eat. Uh, some of the uh, other interesting control methods was um, one of, there was an article where um, a, they were trying to stock American eels in hopes that they would actually predate the sea lamprey uh, and bring down their populations, which of course didn't work. What the sea lamprey control program and, and early, early sea lamprey um, uh, control program members uh, eventually settled on what was, what was what's called uh, a mechanical weir. So what this essentially is, is just a screen uh, in the middle of the river um, with a trap where you know you um, catch fish, then you pass the native fish upstream, and then you remove the sea lampreys. Well, you know these are are good in the sense that they block sea lampreys, but bad because they're they're not selective. But also in the spring when you had high waters and um, storms, you know these things got blown out very easily. So moving from um, uh, what we call mechanical weirs. Um, the next in the development was uh, what we call electrical weirs. And so, uh, as you can see, these were uh, definitely not OSHA safe. So they, they hooked right into the, the power lines nearby. Um, and what they were is they were a series of electrodes uh, across the river. And so uh, what these would do would either um, uh, cause the sea lamprey or encourage the sea lamprey to go towards the trap, or if not that, uh, they would actually kill the fish. And uh, again, similar issues plagued these as, the, as with the early, uh, early weirs. So these things were, were not selective. Um, you know, this is an example of, of a fish kill that uh, unfortunately was running upstream uh, at the same time as the sea lampreys and just got caught in, uh, in the, uh, the crossfire there. Eventually, the control program shifted to trying to find a, uh, a, a chemical control, a selective toxicant uh, for sea lamprey. And so the Hammond Bay Biological Station, which is the, this research station up north that I keep mentioning, they, they were the, uh, the place where the sea lamprey research was happening. Um, so it, it was remarkable. The, um, the researchers up there, uh, what they would do is they would uh, solicit chemicals from any number of companies. You know, they, they, uh, the companies actually wouldn't tell them what, what chemical they were giving them in case uh, there was a chance that it wasn't actually uh, a promising chemical. You know, they, they didn't want the researchers to know, um, you know, because that, that was their, their patent for, for them to use. So researchers tested, uh, I believe, around 6,000 chemicals. And what they would do is uh, run, and pretty simply, actually, they would run just bioassays. And, and so what this is, is they would um, have a jar, they would put um, two larval lampreys in, um, and then two native fish species, I believe they were trout and bluegill. And then they would put different concentrations of, um, of this chemical, any chemical, in, into, the, uh, into the jars, and, and then they would just see what would happen. And so it wasn't until uh, chemical number 5,209 uh, did we find uh, a selective pesticide. And uh, funny enough, that is actually uh, TFM or the lampricide that, that I talked about earlier. So this, uh, this miraculous discovery all the way back in um, 1956 uh, is still the same exact chemical that we use today. And you can see that um, the, the, uh, the man who was weighing the chemicals and running bioassays 
uh, because he recognized uh, the enormity of what he just saw, instead of writing data into the chemicals uh, bioassay card, he just wrote special. Uh, and, and it truly was special. You know, we, we still use uh, TFM as our, our primary control method today. And um, you know, nowhere else is there a, a selective uh, pesticide for an aquatic invasive species uh, like lampricide. Um, and so I just want to do a quick plug here for um, my colleague, his, uh, Dr. Corey Brand. Um, he recently published a book called Great Lakes Sea Lamprey, The 70-Year War on a Biological Invader. And so most of the images and information that I was just telling you about um, is all, with, all a result of his work. So he actually did a um, postdoctoral uh, oral history project where he went all around the Great Lakes Basin um, interviewing key luminaries uh, from the sea lamprey story. So, um, so I told you about that that person that weighed uh, the TFM and wrote special on that data card. He was actually able to interview that 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 person that was there and see the original triple beam balance he used to to weigh his chemicals. He found an, an enormous amount of super cool stuff. Um, and so, if you're at all interested in um, the sea lamprey story and you want to learn about the history, I highly suggest you you check out his book. So now that we've talked about the past, let's look a bit uh, to the future. Um, and so some uh, the GLFC is investing a substantial amount of money into um, future control methods, what we call supplemental controls. Uh, because the uh, lampricide is our primary control method, uh, we want these methods to supplement uh, lampricide. So one of these uh, that we're looking at is sterile male release. Um, so this is a technique that we, we discontinued back and we tried to discontinue back in the late 90s. Um, but essentially what it is, is uh, taking uh, a, a male sea lamprey and capturing it when it's running upstream to spawn in these traps. And then we'll take it to our research station, uh, sterilize it, and then actually re-release it. So that it goes, finds a, uh, an, a fertile female, and then when they go to reproduce, uh, they'll actually produce sterile offspring and then both will die. Now, early on, um, as I mentioned, we used this in the 90s. We've since realized that we need to utilize this in, in much smaller systems. Um, so we're, we're doing a, a significant amount of research into how that, that can be, be applied into um, systems where uh, the inflow and outflow of uh, sea lampreys is uh, much more controlled. And another really interesting um, aspect of uh, future research and supplemental controls is what we call pheromones. And so sea lampreys, um, their nasal organ is, I think it's like six or eight times larger than, than their brain. So sea lampreys are definitely smelling creatures. And so they use uh, these pheromones, which are, are essentially just uh, scents emitted in the water um, to do a lot of their day-to-day uh, -day, um, day -day things. So for example, um, there's attractant pheromones. So um, they use these for mating. So if a male sea lamprey is ready to mate, they will excrete a pheromone telling the, uh, the, the female sea lamprey, hey, let, let's, let's get going. Um, and then also, uh, males actually are of, are the first of the two, uh, the males and the females. The males are the first ones to enter uh, streams to go find suitable spawning habitat. And so uh, male sea lampreys, once they find suitable spawning habitat, they'll actually release an attractive pheromone that tells the female sea lamprey, hey, I, I found a good spot. Let's, let's get up here and um, start reproducing. On the opposite end of that, uh, we have repellents. And so um, these are primarily uh, in the form of alarm cues. So these are given off by a dead sea lamprey uh, to tell uh, other sea lamprey, you know, get away from here, we, we, you don't wanna be here. Um, and so the idea uh, in using this in control is that we wanna do what's called push-pull. Um, so we use the attractants to uh, guide the sea lampreys to somewhere that we want them to go, say, um, a stream, if there's a fork in a stream, we want, it to, want them to go on the side of the fork with the traps. Um, and then we use the repellents in the side, uh, uh, the side of the stream that we don't want them to go so that we can uh, increase trapping efficiency, you know, hopefully to the point where, you know, we can incorporate that as a substantial control method. And so one really cool uh, video I have for you guys here. So this, this uh, you'll see a researcher here. This is a tank of sea lampreys. He's going to apply a... Um, a uh, chemical that, that synthesized alarm cue. And so you'll see here that the sea lampreys just absolutely go, uh, go bananas.
Um, and so, as you can see by that, um, you know, the, these um, alarm cues, these repellent pheromones, you know, are, are really strong in the, the sea lampreys having a, a really adverse reaction to that. So, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this develops. And so as I conclude here, um, I just want to reiterate how, uh, how much of a remarkable success sea lamp rate control is. Um, you know, since the uh, historic highs in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission has reduced sea lamp rate populations by over 90% compared to those historic highs. Um, sea lamp rays are, are one of the, uh, the best, if uh, not the best, uh, controlled in aquatic invasive species in the world. It is uh, the only um, aquatic invasive species, aquatic invasive versa, vertebrate uh, species control program uh, in, in the world. Um, there really are no other uh, invasive species control programs uh, like there is for sea lion brain. So you can see, um, and we, we have uh, graphs here for each of the different lakes. Um, so we have sea lamprey abundance goals that we set for ourselves. And as you can see, we, we are meeting our goals in Michigan and Ontario. Um, we are almost at the goal in Huron. Um, we are a little bit above our goal in Superior, uh, but still on the decline. And then same thing with Erie, you know, um, not quite at our goal, but, but uh, declining populations, which, which is promising. Um, so even though we're not meeting those goals, um, right now, uh, we're we're on the way to meeting those, and and you're looking if you're looking at the long term, uh, like I mentioned, we have reduced those uh, those populations by, by over ninety percent, which is a, a great success. Um, because without sea lamprey control, you know you wouldn't have the the seven billion dollar fishery. This this fishery supports over seventy five thousand jobs. It's the backbone of, of many communities, and it's a shared resource uh, by so many throughout the Great Lakes. And so um, sea lamprey control is essential. It, it must be ongoing. Um, and it is key to the, the future of our Great Lakes fishery. Uh, and with that, um, if you want to learn more, feel free to check out our website at glfc.org or um, follow us on Facebook or Twitter at uh, Lamprey Control. Thank you. Awesome. What a, like, frightening but hopeful right like that there's these these things that are happening that are very effective that uh, that that you all are, are partaking in um now is the chance to ask ross any questions um that uh, uh you may have about the presentation or any of the content um any anything to do with sea lamprey on the great lakes um i'll start with uh one before we get into some of the audience questions and i think one of the things you know, we hear most about in Wisconsin, I, I do anyway, is about Asian carp. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it, you know, you said that there's, there's an only, you know, this is one of the only programs to fight invasive species on, on the Great Lakes is for sea lamprey. Are you all working on something? Because all I've heard is it's only a matter of time before Asian carp kill all the salmon. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, so we aren't, in, in our fishery management role, we, we are involved in that. Um, so we help a little bit with uh, what's called the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee. Um, so we have some folks from our office that, that are on that. Um, but uh, because we were created mainly for the sea lamprey and um, to help coordinate fishery management, um, that isn't explicitly within our duties, though we do help assist with that. Um, and, and the Asian Carp is, if you're looking at it in terms of uh, invasive species, it's actually a really interesting case because um, most often with invasive species, what happens is it, you don't really know it's a problem until um, they're in the system and, and they're creating havoc. Uh, and, and by then, you know, you really ha can't do a whole lot about it. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about Asian carp is, you know, they, they haven't made it to the Great Lakes and we have the opportunity to uh, to be here and, and prevent them from getting in, into the lake. So I, I think, in terms of looking at uh, aquatic invasive species and, and policy as a whole, it, it's just very interesting that we've um, we've gotten support before they've they've gotten in the Great Lakes, and um, we sounded the alarm uh, before they really proliferated and, and got to the point where um, you know there's no turning back. Sure, yeah, um, and this, I mean I feel like that's one of those things that spurred this field of environmental science a generation beyond when you needed it to exist, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so John is asking on Facebook, do these breed in like the Milwaukee? So we have all our tributaries of our uh, main Milwaukee River that go into Lake Michigan. When you put up that map of where they have their spawning grounds, you know, all I'll say is like, don't go down past Chicago, which is 
pretty good advice anyway. But, um, you know, like, are there any, like, coming, you know, it, it seems like they're coming up from Door County in the north on Lake Michigan and then coming up from the south. But part of our shoreline on, on Wisconsin is kind of untouched so far. Yeah, um, that, that's a good observation. You know, I, I believe that um, that, uh, that that figure is a little bit outdated. I, I believe there are some sea lamprey producing streams over there. Um, but uh, again, because primarily the um, our, our control agents, the Fish, Fish and Wildlife Service or uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, they would they would have a really good idea. You know, they're they're out there almost year after year. They they are. Uh, boots on the ground, you know, they, they know sure. what these things like the back of their hand. Um, so off the top of my head, I'd say there, there likely is, um, though I can't name specifics, um, but that, that is a good observation. I, I think that graphic is a little bit outdated. All I got to say is, you know, if you, there's a lot of guys with just buckets and boats if you just need people to go dump some chemicals in places. <laughs> yeah, that's all, that's, that's, that's all, all it is, all right? Yeah. And that's all good. No science whatsoever. <laughs> um, Raleigh's asking, and you, you maybe covered this earlier on in the presentation, but do they have a natural predator? Or maybe another way to look at this, too, is um, how are they affecting the existing lamprey population that aren't sea lampreys, too? Yeah, so... Um, so they don't in their in their native range. Um, they, as I mentioned, because they co-evolved uh, with the the larger species there, the whales, the tuna, uh, the the much larger species. Um, they're not actually acting as predators like they are in the Great Lakes. Um, so they're not really having that uh, that um, as as detrimental of effect. You know, there there are um, predators for them. You know, um, larger fish will eat them. You know, uh, like something like a shark or something like a whale or like even a bird might pick it off. Um, but that that's that's the problem with invasive species generally is um, in their in the Great Lakes. You know, they they don't have predators, and that's the reason why why they tend to flourish is because there's um, there's no natural predators. There's nothing kind of keeping that population in check. Sure. Um, I think so. This is a good, always kind of a good angle to wrap up when we're talking about environmental things. Um, Jeremy's asking, is there anything that you know normal people can do? Like, what what can we do in our daily lives um, other than kind of just be aware? But yeah, um, I, I think one one thing that uh, we tell a lot of folks, especially if you're fishing, um, is to uh, if you're using bait, don't don't be transferring bait. Um, you know, wash clean, dry uh, any bait buckets or boats. Um, and then also on a um, more from, from a policy side, um, get, get involved with your um, your elected officials. You know, let them know that that the Great Lakes are important to you. You know that you care about things like uh, Asian carp, Lake Sea Lamprey. That uh, you you know that the Great Lakes fishery is important uh, to uh, the folks in in your community, and, and just let them know that you know we, you'd like to see. You think this is an issue that that deserves funding. Um, I, I think that's a great place to start. Is definitely your uh, elected officials, um, anywhere from uh, local all the way up to um, you know Congress. Um, any anything that you can do uh, to just um, be promoting the Great Lakes and um, general um, sustainability of this shared resource, I think, is, is positive. That's that's a, a great message to take with us uh, tonight. Ross Shaw from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission uh, talking about sea lamprey. Um, next week, we have our My Milwaukee uh, Youth Art Ex exhibition uh, that we'll be doing virtually this year. Uh, so make sure uh, you all tune into that. But Ross, thanks so much for being on the program tonight. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. It was great to be here. Everybody have a, a great weekend. Uh, we're finally out of the doldrums of winter. So I hope everybody can get out and enjoy some of the well, somewhat decent weather. We're not quite into summer or spring weather <laughs> yet, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, yeah. But everybody have a good one. And uh, we'll see you all next week, I hope.